Welcome to the Olentangy Local Schools Board of Education regular meeting. Today's Thursday, August 10th, 2017. It is 6 p.m. We're in the Olentangy Administration offices, the Berlin Room. With that, Mrs. Hatfield, you call the roll. Mrs. Spiesel? Here. Mr. King? Here. Mr. O'Brien? Here. Mrs. Patrick? Here. And Mr. Bartz? Here. Would you please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> flag. I think that flag has feet. The flag has feet. It always ends up in a different spot. <laughs> So before we approve the agenda, or get a motion to approve the agenda, we do have an addendum. Uh, specifically, there are human resources items as um, final staff slots are being filled. So we have a copy of that here. And so I'm going to ask if there's any comments on the agenda. And if none, I'd uh, appreciate a motion to approve the agenda with the addendums, please. I'll move. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. King? Yes. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mrs. Patrick? Yes. And Mr. Bartz? Yes. On the board's president's report, I just am excited that the new school year is going to start. I'm going to give my time, though, to Dave uh, King tonight because he's going to give a, just a brief update of some things that came out of our recent facilities committee meeting um, a couple, and a couple of uh, good things about some budgets and things. So, Dave, if you want to certainly up to speed. It was really a very good meeting the other night. Uh, everybody was in attendance. Mm -hmm. Good conversations is clearly they're going to be ramping up to uh, their presentation to us on population trends and building needs over a long period of time in November. Um, they are going to be having a meeting on September 6th. It will be a subcommittee of the group uh, that they've used before and, is, and the same people that presented to us last time. They'll meet with Tracy and with Scott and uh, start to talk about particular uh, mo moving more of a shift to how they presented population trends at our previous time last November. They're going to be looking at 10-year cycles, as we traditionally have. But as, again, they did last time, they're going to look at a much longer time period as well to look for trends. Uh, Jeff uh, did a really good job of going through currently owned properties and what buildings they would support, like an elementary, a middle, whatever. And uh, we went back and forth with Scott's slides. If you remember when we went through dist redistricting, one of his key slides showed land that is in a position to be developed. And then comparing uh, where we have properties with where we see big growth, um, uh, Jeff will be asking Scott to combine that into one slide, and it will also have primary uh, roads on that slide, too. So that should be a really strong visual about where are, where, what do we have for properties? What are we looking at for major growth? Strategic decisions can come out of that. Uh, as you, I think, are aware, Jack will become uh, much more involved as, as we look at uh, the building needs. <coughs> and then, of course, he gave the group an update on the uh, high school and Shanahan uh, renovation, which are both going really well. Good news is that, as the old saying goes, uh, it's, it, they're ahead of schedule and their budgets are very much in line. The contingencies are both in great shape. And um, a subcommittee will also start an investigation of creating security vestibules at our three high schools that is similar in the design to Berlin. So that's, I was really glad to see that moving forward. And it was nice to see Emily in attendance. I think that's a good move for her to be there as they talk <coughs> about costs. Absolutely. Oh, so Dave, I have a question. Can you remind me where our land is? I think it's Curve, Bunny Station, and Bean Oiler, but I don't know how much, do you know which you one? You know, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't bring that with okay. me, but I'll send it to you as to what they support. Yeah. Curve can be, I might be wrong, but as I recall, Curve can be middle and, and elementary. elementary. Okay. Of course, okay. you have the, the um, shoot, just lost it, the middle school that's set up to accept a elementary school. Berkshire. On, like Berkshire and Hyatt. Berkshire and Hyatt, yes. both. Mm -hmm. And Bean Oiler is elementary only. Okay. And what am I missing? Bunny Station. Bunny Station, I think, can support a middle or an elementary. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Bean Oiler is um, about 16, 16, 20 acres in that, 20, 20 acres in that range. Mm -hmm. Curve, the curve sites at Curve and Sweeney. 
and then it's approximately between 45 and 50 acres, and same with Bunny Station. Mm -hmm. So they've been labeled elementary, middle mm -hmm. slash middle school, yeah. depending on the need. So that report that they're working on, Dave, is it going to be like um, projected middle school needs for the future? They'll look at the primary focus will be an elementary 16. Okay. And but they will look at the middle school as well because again they're going to take it out like 50 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Understanding the crystal ball is cloudier, mm -hmm. but I think that was a very useful discussion when we were talking about this last year. And how are we trending with our enrollment yeah. projections? I heard kindergarten was higher than anticipated. Mm -hmm. Yes. It? No. Right now we're sitting about 200, 195 over uh, future <laughs> things enrollment projections. Um, and that's typical. We'll lose yeah. some. Mm -hmm. um, we've been trying. We've been keeping it real tight. Uh, you know, with regards to being resistant and adding staffing. Todd is. I've asked him um, to analyze it from the standpoint of what's it look like from the last five years or so. Future think. You know, from like five data points. Mm -hmm. Our our projected enrollments versus future thinks from April to May to June, and and then that gave us a better gauge of where we maybe needed to pull the trigger. And then we also started looking at it on a building by building basis. So a more stable environment that doesn't have quite as many students who transfer in and out, typically like an old Tangy Meadows mm -hmm. is more transient. They lost 50, 45 um, students from uh, the where we were projecting and where they ended up. Another building, spot on because they're, they just are more stable. So we're try, tightening up a couple of those processes and it's helped us with staffing. So obviously, like with adding two third grades here, mm -hmm. it, we waited to the last possible minute to pull the, pull the trigger on that one. So um, overall, uh, though we're at 195 over right now, but we anticipate it'll be under 100 off projections, which is still less than around a percent, less mm -hmm. than one mm -hmm. percent. Mm -hmm. hey, could we get a look at that of the budget for Berlin? where we are by major category, where we are with contingency, and where we expect he, that to he look. He presented to that, so I'll send it to you. Or I'll but ask I Jeff to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but I, I assume it. Emily would be kind of overseeing more of the oh, yeah. sources That's and uses cool. of contingency. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll give you that information. Okay. He had that for the Shanahan as well. Oh, I can see both, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, one thing I forgot to add at the beginning is we do have an executive session tonight, so when we get to that point, we will be going to executive session and we will only be coming back to adjourn. You're welcome to hang out if you'd like and watch us adjourn. Mm -hmm. We're always welcome people. So with that, Mr. Rafe. Hey, Patrick, we'll see if I can take direction. Oh, yes. it worked. Good. Told me what button to push, so. Welcome, welcome, everybody. It's always great to see People in attendance. Uh, seems like we haven't had a meeting in a long time. But, oh, I know. <laughs> but um, so we'll start off as usual with a couple of good things. We went out, took some pictures of the um, preschool uh, at, at Shanahan. So you see, outside of our old entrance, we're uh, installing playground equipment, and it's going to be fenced in and a new surface there for for the kids. It'll be, I think, a nice contained area for them to uh, as a as a playground. Um, classrooms, you know, old offices. So this is a first floor office looking mm -hmm. uh, north. So it might have been the old HR area or uh, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. So, you know, obviously you see it's already getting loaded up with looking very, very much like a preschool classroom. Um, so people are working furiously to just get, get all the final touches in there and uh, be ready for the arrival. Um, this is our old board office, uh, oh. our board of education room. So, uh, you know, again, they're just finishing up the, some final touches, cleaning, and and, um, and so if we wanted to go back and have a board meeting on the preschool tricycles, Devin decided to get creative with his pictures. And well, I mean, mm -hmm. kidding aside, as we, you know, tying it back to our previous conversation, could we get an update on capacity given that? We're now moving preschool space into here, out of the elementaries with the intent of taking pressure off of the elementary Correct. for specialized mm -hmm. learning centers? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that, that kind of goes, we'll go back to and kind of refresh. Um, I'll have uh, Mr. Fetty do that from the standpoint of 
Um, if you remember the conversation we had leading into this decision about our overall elementary capacity, where we were, and then, you know, number of classroom spaces we projected that we needed for this year, for next year, because that'll kind of, and where enrollment's trending, because that'll drive us to. Position bias, time. Yes. Right. For elementary school. 21, 2021, 20, 21. Yeah, because it would be good to know if we're still on track for that. Mm -hmm. so. And that's all information we're feeding facilities, so. Yeah. So a uh, little addition to our state assessment update, as we dug deeper into the data, we have now found that we had 406 students earn a perfect score on at least one subject area, an additional 41 students earned perfect scores on two subject areas, and two students earned perfect scores in three different subjects. So that's just great, um, a great accomplishment by those students who were in the process <clears throat> of informing their, their families and um, it's a significant accomplishment. Uh, our curriculum team, um, Mrs. McMurray and, and her team organized the annual New Teacher Academy for three days. We welcome in 100 new teachers for this year uh, participated in the event. <clears throat> and uh, they just do a phenomenal job indoctrinating the new staff into the old Tangy culture and how um, you know, we, our expectations uh, of our new teachers. So. Very, very energizing to see them in action. What's the net number? So the hundreds do, but some of those are replacements versus two total growth. Do you know what that mix might be, roughly? So we had uh, deferred. 46 for growth, uh, 54. Uh, retirement, replacement, yeah. retirement, resignation. Some within that 54 within that 100 uh, are the ESL students. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
getting the vendors there for us. Uh, they actually donated $50 each to OEF to be a part of the vendor fair. Oh, so that's a good idea. That's, that's, uh, it's just nice to see that community engagement. Obviously, the first day of school, we will be welcoming over 20,500, right now projections are 20,800 students with an additional, eventually, 450 preschool kids. So we will officially be over 21,000 as a district come this school year. And then our next board meeting is August 22nd. So, questions? Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rafe. Mrs. Hatfield, Treasurer's Report, please. Absolutely. Um, we had a meeting actually just this evening to talk with our financial <coughs> uh, municipal advisors, with our underwriting team, and our bond council to discuss our uh, ratings presentation for the bond refunding that we have proposed um, this fall. We are going to refund the 2007 series bonds. It's about a $5 million um, set, of fun, a set of bonds, excuse me. Um, that refunding will save us a net present value of over $800,000. Um, so we're moving forward with having the rating presentation preparation. Um, we'll have that call next Tuesday, and then we'll continue through that process to close and get those bonds refunded. Um, we've also had um, some good news in that uh, as part of um, our membership with the Ohio GFOA organization, which is the Government Finance Officers Association for the local chapter, um, I ran as part of a committee or ran to be a part of the Board of Trustees and was elected as such. Good. So, good. so in September I'll be... Um, sworn in for that the board of trustees so i'm excited to move forward with that and and get uh, dive deeper into that organization and grow with that professional development um, in terms of items on the board agenda we have two items we have minutes from our june 8th 22nd and july 6th meetings and then uh, we also have some donations we would like to approve we would like to thank um, monica Roden for her donation of student workbooks for the iReady program at Oak Creek Elementary. Um, we would like to thank uh, Johnny Cake Elementary PTO for a purchase of Cuomo Quest Pro Boards, which are an electronic whiteboard, um, totaling over $12,000. And we would like to thank the Olin TNG Liberty Athletic Boosters for making donations for assistant, an additional assistant field hockey coach and girls assistant soccer coach, um, a half time person for that. Um, those totaling over uh, 5,000. Um, so we thank all of our community members who continue to give not only of monetarily, but of their time. And we're excited to move forward into the new school year. Are there any questions that you have for me? I, I have a question. Yes, Has uh, the county auditor said anything about the reappraisals? Like, um, the re in terms of like of percentage like, growth yeah um you know we discussed that when we went through the five-year forecast um they had initially gave us given us an estimate of about a 10 percent or a little higher meaning a double digit growth um historically we felt six percent was is where we've been trending um that's what we've put in the forecast for may because we went back and looked at the trends from the economic downturn in 2008 when we lost valuation um, we saw small growth of 2% over the next couple of years, and then it's just 4%, 6%. So we, we kept it relatively small at 6 I think, or reasonable. Um, and we'll continue to reach out and have further conversations to see if they have any change in that as we get into the five-year forecasting. Because Franklin County, he's been pretty vocal about mm -hmm. the increases. Um, so I just wondered if Delaware County was... I don't believe that they've released any information okay. on it, but we'll continue to, to walk through that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Hatfield. You're welcome. Um, any public comments for session one? No, there are none. With that, we'll go into discussion items and welcome Mr. Fetty, who's going to talk about the CIP. Good evening. 
Um, I am presenting the uh, 1718 continuous improvement plan for your uh, approval tonight. Uh, there's only one change from last year's plan in benchmark five, um, increasing um, from 90% to 100%. The indicator that says we will increase or maintain 100% of juniors and seniors participating in advanced placement courses, college credit plus courses, mentorship, global scholars or industry certification programs and or earning an Ohio honors diploma and or earning a remediation score on all areas of the ACT or SAT. All of those measures are deemed to be uh, measures of career and or college readiness, something beyond the high school diploma, an indicator of success beyond the high school diploma. Um, so we, we changed some of that language a couple of years ago and we have been slowly increasing it to our goal this year of 100% that we want all of our graduates to achieve one of those um, one of those indicators, if not more than one. Um, so that is the only change from last year. Otherwise, um, you might recall we went through over the past couple of years a pretty um, substantial revision process of this document, so we're pretty happy with where it stands otherwise. And I'll remind you that this is the document we use to uh, measure the success of our buildings and every year we create an annual report based on the district's performance against all of these benchmarks and indicators as well as each building's performance against these benchmarks and indicators. All of our buildings will create building continuous improvement plans this year um, as they do every year to you know, plan how they will meet these goals and um, <clears throat> this will also dovetail nicely with the strategic plan which we will be presenting to you soon. Uh, last year, growth was the thorn in our side. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten from the preliminary results any growth measures? No, even uh, preliminary growth data has been released from the state yet. It's usually the last to come out. I would expect to see it hopefully by the end of August, but maybe even just early September, a couple weeks before the report card itself. So no idea where we're at with growth. We have, we have lots of other preliminary data and it all looks good. Um, we thought last year's growth me measures were kind of a yeah. mystery, so we, we're hopeful that it won't happen twice, um, but we don't know yet. Well, on that preliminary data, now that the teachers and the principals are preparing for this coming school year, do they have that so that they can prepare, or what, I mean, or is it too preliminary? They have the preliminary data that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that's available, we share it with the principals so that it can inform their planning, but they also know that it is not final yet. So um, they don't necessarily overreact to, to all of it, but um, we know which, which data typically stays consistent from when it's first released to when it's finalized, and which data fluctuates a lot. Um, we're pretty good at projecting all that data now, so most of it we're fairly confident in, so they're using it as best they can. We've also, because we have the individual test scores, we've already started to create our individual student projections, which go into that first benchmark. So all the buildings will have their student projections to start the year. They'll have the student watch lists already created. So they've already begun making math groups and reading groups to intervene where necessary. Um, and then finally, has the state told you when they will be releasing the information, especially to the parents? Uh, in terms of district data? Yeah. Um, I was just told sometime in September. Have they told Yeah, I've heard roughly mid-September, but I as far as has the state actually told me directly. Yeah, no. or released anything no. to you guys to say, watch, no. this will come out. Yeah, not, they have not, but I've been hearing mid-September. So that's what I would expect. It's not going to be pretty across the state, just in general. I talked to an area superintendent. They increased in every tested subject area, increased their per percentage of passing, proficient, advanced, accelerated, and went from meeting 13 indicators to meeting two indicators because this cut score went the so score. similar to what they did with the third grade reading guarantee where they increase the cut score every right. year I have a question mm -hmm. and, and maybe Julie knows a little bit about this because of the testing <clears throat> conversation so I received as a parent my state testing scores did not help the district at all with my <laughs> son and this is what this is what I find difficult to understand so my child has dyscalculia okay so he is significantly behind in math but he's being tested at the grade level mm -hmm. so how could he possibly show improvement when he's behind it's not like they're testing what he actually learned they're testing what they've determined the seventh grade curriculum is so 
that's my question. How, how do we show growth? Because he's grown in math. But I thought that was, a, that was what it was supposed to catch. Well, so growth, it should, uh, that should factor in. So yeah. it will take his testing history and will project his growth based on how he's done in the past. Right, and not necessarily me, it, it as far as, in its entirety, right. it's for him. Proficiency yeah. is the standard benchmark for everybody across the state. Does the, does the material change to be seventh grade level, then eighth grade level, and so? Yes, it does. But he was it. tested the previous year on a lower level. Right. But if he showed growth, that should be reflected. That's what I, I thought. They Am say, I if this is how you performed on seventh grade date, yeah. um, test material last year, here's where we expect you will perform on the eighth grade oh. test material this year. Yeah. Okay. And then they yeah. see where you actually perform. And if you, if you hit that benchmark, you meet growth. That benchmark could be well above proficient, right at proficient, or even below proficient. But you could still meet growth and be below proficient. So a parent wouldn't know that. No, no. The district would get that. So data. as far as the district data is concerned, remember, growth is only calculated for, I think it's still subgroups of 30 students or more. So there, in theory, there is individual student growth, but in actuality, there is no individual student growth. I cannot look up your child's growth data and find out did your child grow or not grow. I can find cohorts within the grade. And now I can look at scores and I can make a determination based on you know, what I know, but the, st the state does not actually attribute to each individual child an above growth or a below growth score. That's an aggregate score for groups of kids. And it's all it's very confusing. Group, it doesn't even count. Right. It doesn't give the schools very much data to work with to know if they are actually. I mean, that's why we have our own assessments. Right. Because we're not getting it from. Right. We remember um, years ago when we had we were participated in the SOAR program through mm -hmm. Patel for Kids. Um, the test was consistent from year to year. Mm -hmm. The growth measures were well understood. The teachers were trained on how to interpret the reports. We like to think that that was usable growth data. It was also non-evaluative. It didn't have to do with the teacher's evaluation. Mm -hmm. It was just good information to use to help students. As the test has changed and the way they calculate growth has changed multiple times over the past year, it becomes less meaningful in the classroom, unfortunately. If it ever does stabilize, it is still a good tool, I think, um, but it has to stabilize. Thank you. Okay. Good information. Other questions for Mr. Fetty? Thank you, Mr. Fetty. Thank you very much. Next, uh, the board's going to uh, welcome uh, Bob Lamb, Delaware County Director of Economic <laughs> Development, who's going to talk about the Delaware County Economic Development Plan. So welcome, Mr. Lamb. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Bob Lamb, I'm the Economic Development Director for the county. Mm -hmm. I've been with the county for two years, actually, as of yesterday. Um, and so when I first came on, one of the main directions that was asked to me was to put together a plan that would help guide us forward for the next 13 years. And really what our main goal in my office is, is to bring in new investment, commercial investment, to the county that can help diversify our tax base, provide job opportunities within the county, but most importantly, provide the revenue sources that we need to provide services to the residents within the county. And so I'm gonna quickly walk you through what our economic development action plan is. It's approximately a 13-year plan, and what we will focus on here is really our primary sources of concern for being able to track those investment opportunities, and then do a very quick discussion on the secondary. We'll start off by giving a quick overview of where Delaware County stands today, and what are some of the pluses that we have to attract investment to the county, but also some of the challenges that we face. Picture of Delaware County and where it sits within Central Ohio area. And so you can see here the growth that we've experienced as a county. In 1990, we we're approximately 67,000 people, and today we're almost 200,000. We are on track under the Morpsey numbers that by 2040 we could hit 350,000. So an additional 150,000 bodies coming to the county. And so, how are we going to handle that with infrastructure needs? How are we going to handle it with resource demands? So here you can see where we sit with in compared to what we consider to be similar like communities within the state of Ohio. And these communities were chosen based upon their demographics, um, based upon their location to major metropolitan areas, and how we feel that they best were similar, well, I guess I would say how they were similar to us in a multitude of ways. And so we wanted to compare how do we stand against these types of communities in Ohio. As you can see, median family income, we lead the state at approximately 92,000, um, significantly over 
what we consider to be our competitors from a community standpoint. Home ownership rate, again, we're number one in the state with almost 82% of our residents being homeowners, which is really a large benefit for us. It brings ties to the community. It lets us know that we have a length of time to work with residents and that we are not a transitory community. Education-wise, we're about 51% of our residents have at least a bachelor's degree. When we actually look at this at the associate level, this number rises to 60%. That means we're approximately three times the national average for education within the county. Again, another huge benefit when we go out and try to market to a company why they should make their next investment here. Poverty rate is 4.8%, and this is actually last year's number. We are down currently to 3.8 as of today, and under the projections, we could hit below 3.5 by the end of the year. Again, though, those are projections we will see uh, come January where we actually are. Mean commute time is 25.7, and so you can start seeing where one of the disadvantages is that we face as a community, and that's traffic patterns. If you're trying to get downtown or getting home, you understand what you face and currently to give you an idea of what that looks like and how it will play out in the future our workforce today is approximately a hundred thousand individuals 80 percent of that workforce goes south every day to work and comes home northbound at the same time so that, since we are an automobile based community that is 80,000 vehicles that we're putting on the road at the same time in the same direction with 150,000 re new residents coming to the community over the next 20 years, that could increase that number by a minimum of 40, maximum of 60,000. And so that takes that 80,000, turns it into 120 to 140,000 vehicles. We don't have a lot of options for putting in new roadways, so it's finding ways to invest in the existing roadways that we have to help minimize that time. We use the mean commute time here because that's the average within the economic development and development world we use to look at times, but the average time within the county for travel is 43 minutes each direction. That means that our residents are spending about an hour plus on the road every day trying to get to and from work. Our concern obviously is as traffic increases and length of time to get to work increases, that can have a significant impact on quality of life issues. And as quality of life is affected, so comes the desire to live within your community and reinvest within your community. So what we wanted to do here was show you what is the value of bringing commercial investment and bringing it down to the individual level. And we feel that what's driving growth predominantly within Delaware County is the amazing school systems that we have here in the community, Olentangy being a leader within that area and so we wanted to show what does our commercial framework look like when looking at other central ohio communities and so you can see here we selected dublin westerville southwestern and new albany school districts to look at total assessed value of land within olentangy is the highest within that area um, that means generating a lot of tax dollars be able to provide for the services that are needed within it however when we switch over to look at how much of that is coming off commercial we see only 3.2%. That means that approximately 97% of the revenue being derived within the Olentangy school system is coming from single family homes. That means as service demands increase, the only reliable source for new revenue is the residents within the community. We wanna be making smart investments in commercial opportunities so that we can see that shift. We want more commercial to come in to add and diversify that tax base so that we can better be able to provide services without having to go back to residents. So we really broke Delaware County into three main areas, north, central, and south. With the north area is the least likely to see immediate investment opportunities within. Central is really starting to pick up, and in fact, we just launched a 36-37 corridor study. Um, parts of Olentangy School Districts are within that study area. And what our main goal there is to look at what are the development opportunities along 36-37, what's market feasible along that area, and then working with the local communities and landowners to reposition the land in a manner that will make it very attractive to commercial end users coming in. We know that it's gonna grow residentially within that corridor, but we wanna make sure that as much land as possible we're positioning for commercial growth. Our goal is to see land transition from 
single family type development to commercial development. We want to make it an easy process and encourage that when and where we can so that we can see again that diversification of our tax base. And then the southern area, which is where we're seeing the growth right now, where we're having opportunities to secure new commercial investment, and where we're concentrating a lot of resources to try to take care of those opportunities as they come along. Because again, we are competing with the rest of central Ohio, but not only just central Ohio, we compete with all of Ohio as well as the Midwest. And so we need to be active and engaged with these different developers, different realtors, uh, brokers, in order to attract that next commercial opportunity. So our major growth corridors as we see them are 23, 42, 36, 37, and the 71 corridor. I'm sure it's not a surprise to anybody. It's uh, not only our major growth areas, but it's also where we see traffic patterns um, starting to become longer and a little more challenging to address. So the goals of our plan, as I mentioned before, is really to create new revenue sources, but also to enhance the quality of life. We are predominantly a residential-based community. We understand that. We want to be very respectful of that fact. And so as we go to attract new investment, we want to make sure that it's the right kind of investment for the community, that it's in the right location, and that it's really enhancing the overall quality of life for the residents. We're benchmarking our success um, by saying we're going to establish 56,000 net new jobs by 2030 increase median family income by 100 to 115,000 and facilitate at a minimum 500 million infrastructure improvements. And so to quickly walk you through some of what these numbers mean, when I say we want to increase the median family income to 115,000, when you look at just it growing over time how it has in the past, that number would only hit about 106,000. And so we're adding approximately 10,000 to that goal than what would just naturally occur based upon growth patterns. Over the last about 15 years, we removed 2008 to 2011 from this range in order to try to give a fair approximation of what that would look like. Um, I, I might not have minded keeping it in since it brought the number down, but we didn't feel like that was fair. And then facilitating 500 million in infrastructure development. This is roads, this is sewer, this is water, this is fiber, all the things that are critical to be able to attract commercial opportunities. And, and it is a large number. Um, we are looking at over 200 million in interchange investments just off of 71, over 200 million in other uh, projects from a road transportation standpoint, approximately 136 million in sanitary sewer. So the 500 million is really a minimum amount that we're looking to tackle. That number could easily be more in the 700 million, 800 million dollar range. So it is a large amount of capital that's going to be needed to address the infrastructure needs coming forward over the next 15, 20 years. As I mentioned before, what are our challenges? Commuting traffic times, if you're trying to move north or south at certain times, if you're trying to go east to west at certain times, you know what those challenges are. Water, sewer, and fiber is critical. You cannot land new commercial investment in today's world if you don't have these things, and that includes fiber. If you're not able to meet the technological demands of a company, you will not be able to locate that company. And then the development process. And this is something that we control wholeheartedly at the county level, and we are actively working to try to improve. And I'll walk you through just a couple of these fairly quickly. So what this breaks down to for us is we're focusing on infrastructure, site development, and tax policy and development process. From an infrastructure standpoint, what can we do to make transportation better? How are we leveraging our new sanitary sewer plan to make sure that we can provide sewer in the key locations where we think growth is going to come so that we can head off all of the land going residential and be able to position land for commercial? In today's market, you cannot really finance sanitary sewer development off a commercial project, but you can off residential projects. And so it becomes much easier for a residential developer to come in, pick up a large area of land, develop the sewer system needed to accommodate their development. A commercial company is just not willing to make that investment in today's market. And so we're looking at where can we be proactive to make that investment? How can we do it in a responsible manner for the community, but also getting it done so that we can be competitive in landing that commercial deal? And then fiber optics, again, uh, it's a critical component. We are working right now to hopefully release an RFP before September 
uh, that will help us put in place a plan that will enhance the fiber system as well as the wireless uh, cellular service system throughout the county. We want to make sure that we're a premier community, not only today, but also in the future. And cellular service demand, the ability to provide fiber services will be a key issue to that over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, one of the ways in which you can see that is you can look at the investments that Union County and Franklin County are making along 33 between the Honda plant and Ohio State. Site development. In today's world, you're just not going to land businesses unless you have the sites ready to go. They don't have the time or the desire to wait for you to develop sites. They want sites that are pre-approved. They have everything they need located there, that they know what it is that their investment is going to be needed to get it up and running and that they can do it within a year. And so we are working with Jobs Ohio, we are working with Columbus 2020, as well as local landowners to get our sites certified as ready and also to put in place, you can see here, established last mile policies so that we can have clear financial incentives to take a fiber line, a sewer line, or a water line from where it may be running down along, say, 23 and into somebody's property, doing it quickly and efficiently so that we can bring that company here. And the development process. One of the biggest things that kills deal is time that kills deals is time. And so we're looking at how can we get projects done faster? How can we do it more efficiently? And an environment where there's a better understanding within the private sector of what they're going to have to go through to successfully be able to get their project from concept to doors open. And so we have brought in lean and Six Sigma trainers to address the existing policy. We are working on streamlining zoning processes. And we're looking at working with our community partners to put in place incentive policies that are clear cut, that are easy to maneuver, that we can all agree upon as a community so that we are not spending three, six, nine months a year negotiating various incentive policies with a private entity. That kind of time frame can cause you to lose a deal. We want to try to simplify it in a manner that's fair to everybody and then go forward with being able to advertise that to potential um, developers, potential uh, investment opportunities that are out there. We would like to establish MOU policies with the school districts, with the local communities, so that we can quickly be able to tackle various items and be able to put deals in front of potential end users to be able to land them here in our community so we can start seeing those tax dollars. Some of our secondary efforts, and though they are secondary, it does not mean that they're not important. We're working on putting together a marketing program, something to launch in 2018. That will be a combined effort between a multitude of partners, not just the county going out and saying why you should make investments here, but working with both private businesses, private entities to do that, as well as the CVB chambers within the community and trying to speak with one voice, with one plan, very similar to the endeavors that you've seen undertaken by 2020, Franklin County and Columbus, and trying to speak with one voice. And then some of the additional items, we're concentrating on workforce development. We all know that you have to have a strong workforce to be able to attract businesses to your area. We're incredibly fortunate, not only for the local schools that we have here in Delaware County, but also having the Ohio States, the Columbus States, OWU, and other uh, key universities within the state located here that we can work with to help make sure we have that educated workforce that businesses are looking for. And then we are working on an entrepreneurial center in conjunction with several of our partners. We are hoping that we can bring that together and be able to announce that um, as a successful project over the next few months. And then business retention and expansion. Um, the county has never launched a full-scale business retention and expansion program. We will be doing so in 2018, um, working with the various communities, targeting over 100 businesses, over 14 different events within 2018 in which to engage our businesses. And the main issue there is 80% of your new jobs are going to come from existing businesses within your community. And so if you want to grow your tax base, you really need to be engaged with those existing businesses. In order to do that, you need to be in front of them. You need to understand what are red flag issues to them, issues that could cause them to close their doors or cause them to make that next investment somewhere else and not in your community. And so we want to be aware of those. We want to make sure that we're addressing those needs as we go forward and that we are considered a partner and not just a hurdle in their process of making a choice as the right location for an investment. That really sums up 
the main plan. We are working on several projects that I am hopeful will have an opportunity to be in front of you to further explore. I, in fact, have meetings with some of your staff over the next week or so to discuss those opportunities. Uh, we are looking at one industrial project right now that we are hoping to have approval to provide you notice on that incentive pa package as early as next week. Um, it'd be a 100 acre expansion of existing industrial park. We are excited about these opportunities. We think they are the right types of investment opportunities for our community. And so we're looking forward to hopefully being able to bring many more of those types of projects to you over the next few years. Um, at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, um, whether they're items going on in the community or more general of a nature or towards the economic development plan that we've established. General comment, just me personally. All the things you set up there are wonderful growth, expansion. A lot of the things you set up there put stress on the district because more houses, more development, not commercial, but more residents mean more stress and we, we fund on the back of the taxpayer. So all I would say to you is as you look at these things, as you look for MOUs and other ways to work into agreements with us, we're in a unique situation in that we also get very little from the state. So I don't know if it's the right thing to ask, but politicians love jobs. They love to see businesses built. They love to see money coming into communities. They get tired of Mr. Rafe going down to the state house and saying fair funding, fair funding. <laughs> so you're starting off the process, great growth. And I would tell you that puts some stress on us to think about those things. So whatever influence you have, the ability to help <coughs> alleviate some of that stress makes it probably more easier for this board and for the administration mm -hmm. to think about what these types of investment means and what type of MOUs and types of programs and plans you want to put in place. So it's just a general comment for you. I'm sure you're well aware of our situation. If not, consider this your reminder <laughs> of our situation. I don't know if any of our other people on the board want to expound on that no, any I further. really got to add is, <clears throat> you know, we, as a board, we, we should really get behind and support commercial development because that's where the absolutely. Absolutely. Right. struggle is that proper mix between residential and commercial. Um, residential is going to happen and we almost need to really support agree. and facilitate the commercial development. We've been talking about that for 10 years. Um, that's, that could really help take some of that burden off of that residential taxpayer is to get some good robust commercial development in the 23 corridor and 36, 37 corridor for us. Sawmill Parkway. Right. Yeah, and, and the loss of the Amazon is still raw for me because, yeah, I agree. because of the, the town. And that was an Orange Township thing. That wasn't a well, Orange Township. Township school. I think thing. it was a time but issue. I think it was definitely a time issue. You pointed out issue. one of the biggest obstacles is this mm -hmm. the length of time it takes to get a deal done. Mm -hmm. If you're negotiating with two school districts, three townships, there's got to be a way to streamline that process. And an organization that doesn't, support that's, that. that's risk aver conflict right. averse. Yeah. And Amazon doesn't want conflict. But so I agree with you 100 percent. That's really will be the biggest help. for And us. to that point, you know, what can can we do as a board? Because we do have those groups who are not in my backyard. Yeah. And I don't know that they realize, well, if it is in their backyard, then that is better for the entire community. You, you know, it, it, if we can help you in any way, um, we are willing to help you do that. Th that's um, great to hear. If, if you need us to meet with, you know, township trustees or yeah. city of Powell or whatever, um, because I, yeah. I, I, we've, you know, I was looking at people running for Powell City Council. There are some of those not in my backyard people that are running for city council. Yeah. Um, <clears> so <throat> if there's anything we can do to help, but then I do have a question. Have you identified? types of industries that you believe that would fit well here that's my first question and two what you what is your working relationship with jobs ohio uh first off uh let me say i agree with the statements that you made it is a huge concern bringing new investment especially if that investment is going to be residential based and not commercial we know the growth is coming our main goal is to try to transition that land from a residential zoning or purpose into a commercial purpose to minimize that impact overall. Um, I think the MOUs are a great tool to do that. They can help get that speed and efficiency. We are working with the various school uh, districts within the county to develop some educational materials that I think could be helpful um, in going out to the public and letting them understand better what 
TIFs are, what our incentives, because um, I think it can really get complicated very quickly with those types of incentive policies. We want to make it simple so that they can understand we're trying to make smart investments for the future. Um, to your question of what are our target industries, we are looking at logistics, manufacturing, medical, professional office as our major focus going forward. We believe that we can be competitive within logistics and manufacturing because of our location in central Ohio and the proximity to uh, the rest of the U.S. population in under eight hours. And so you are seeing those investments happen within central Ohio. We believe if we have the sites and we have the systems in place, we can land those investments as well. And then because of the education base that we have as a community, we see a strong niche within the professional service, IT, engineering, law, finance fields that can make us competitive. Um, and then again, with a growing population, medical is an area in which we can secure new investment opportunities and many medical office buildings or facilities do carry a large tax dollar base from a property standpoint with them. So they are a good thing for us to be out there trying to engage. Um, on our relationship with Jobs Ohio, we have a very good relationship with Jobs Ohio. We are working right now to try to get some of our sites, one main site, uh, through the site uh, approval process. And so we're looking to grow that, obviously. We never want to say we have a relationship that we're happy with with Jobs Ohio because we always want to be in front of them more and engage with them more. I have a question about population. Um, at a recent meeting of the Ontangy Rotary Club, there was a county commissioner and he said the population projection for 2050 for the county is, a, is an, an additional 160,000 people. And I, and I noticed your slide there earlier. Well, at a previous Rotary meeting sometime before that, Morpsey projections insight, the tw insight 2050, they said they were projecting a plus 60,000. So I'm wondering if you can rectify that difference. Can you speak to that? Uh, I'm happy to go pull those items and take a look and see where the discrepancy is. Okay. My understanding is this 350 number is from the Morpsey numbers. So I'm happy to look into that and get back to you on that item. One last question on the infrastructure. You mentioned the Delaware County engineer is working, that you're working with them. And now are you, or is the Delaware County engineer also mirroring or managing ODOT infrastructure projects as part of that as well because because sometimes their their projects are based on traffic patterns and need at, at more so than economic development. Mm -hmm. They'll take that in consideration as part of a project, but it's not their primary goal for infrastructure on roadways. Sewers and other things, that's not their business. But so on the roadway side, are you guys partnering with them? And yes, we work very with closely with ODOT. We've had a great relationship with them over the years. Uh, that can be seen um, out by the Tanger Outlet Mall, where we were able to facilitate a deal on getting some improvements done in a manner that ODOT normally would not have signed off on. Um, so I do think we have an excellent working relationship with them. There are times where what our priorities are may not perfectly align with theirs, and we try to navigate those paths as best we can. Um, ODOT's a large entity. They have a lot of pressing matters that they have to undertake. We don't always rise to the top of that list, and that's understandable. Um, but we do try to leverage their dollars when and where we can so that we're offsetting the cost for the community. Because they do filter down dollars on small projects, smaller projects that they don't want to manage to the county. And, and they do have uh, funding for economic development purposes. A lot of those are tied to logistics. So as we yep. get the ability to secure logistics yep. uh, opportunities, we do plan on going to them to ask for assistance. Okay, great. So maybe the last comment would be, is if you'd be willing to spend time with our facilities committee, in particular as we're rolling out these 10-year mm -hmm. forecasts, making assumptions on lane conversion, and does it convert to residential, does it convert to commercial, kind of getting your input and perspective on where you may be targeting conversion yes. to commercial versus That's conversion to residential, yeah. so that our assumptions are kind of aligned with maybe what the county's thinking and economic development's thinking. Yes, uh, more than happy to come to any meetings or provide any materials or work with your staff as you so desire. Well, as most of that commercial growth is going to be on our northern border right now, right? Mm -hmm on the 36-37 corridor, because the 71 is really going to be just the two new projected exits to, to well, residential. Well, then the economic development around the exits. Exactly. Well. well, that's it. But yeah. some of them are Both so close to residential, there won't be, yeah. probably be very little. But, but then, also 23. But right. then I was well, going to say, we've got corridor, some too. prime 23 spots where that Amazon was going to go. Right. You still, know, that's still there. It's still there, <laughs> but it could 
flip back to residential. And the cross street on the Mount Carmel side as well. Yeah, so. Mount right. Carmel side. And there's still a couple hundred acres there. But yeah, I agree. I think that's I think a great, that's that's that a great discussion. I'm sorry? Pulte really? owns that site now. Pulte has a it, contract, I believe. On the, uh, on the Amazon side? The Amazon side or the Mount Carmel side? The Amazon side. No, Home Roads. Home, home, home in, in uh, 23. 23. Mm -hmm. West, West of 23. Well, that's going to be quite a buffer. <laughs> well, perhaps you could check your calendar <laughs> and we'll ask Jeff Gordon, our facilities director here, to contact you about the facilities committee. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, you caught uh, their subcommittee that's going to be starting to look at projections, population, meeting September 6th. September 6th? Okay. Mm -hmm. so put it in my calendar. Maybe that's a possibility. Uh, and then the one thing I would like to add is you were talking about the interchanges, uh, the big walnut interchange that's being forecasted, it's approximately $40 million, and that will be mostly a residential um, interchange. The big key for us from an economic development standpoint and why it's actually a huge priority from an economic development standpoint is it will help alleviate traffic at Polaris. Um, right now, if you go past the Polaris and Gemini exits, you have to go up to 3637. That's approximately 10 miles. This will be four miles north of Gemini and allow for residents who are moving, trying to travel, travel within that area a different uh, off ramp for them than Polaris. And so we can help make Polaris a more commercial based interchange and not a residential and a commercial interchange. That project is still quite a ways out, is it yeah. not? Because of the inability to get some of the land? We have worked with the Army Corps of Engineers to address some of those issues. I believe we have a plan in place to do that. Oh. Um, I can't tell you when we're hoping to break ground. I can tell you the county engineer has expressed his desire to get the project moving. Because some of it is state park land, is it not, on the one side? Uh, or yes, or? and wetland area, that has to be offset. So but it's Trust my understanding understand we've that. laid out the an approved plan through the Army Corps of Engineers, which has been the main item we've been trying to work with them to tackle. Okay. Great presentation. Good yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Lamb. Appreciate that. Uh, Mrs. Hatfield, any uh, participation for session two? No. Okay, no, with that, um, would you present, please, the treasurer action items? Of course. I'd like to present uh, treasurer action items A and B for approval, please. So moved. I'll second. Any comments? Call the roll, please. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. And Mr. Bartz? Yes. I believe the rest of the items are superintendent action items, including the addendum items. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Sorry. So if you present those, Mr. Rafe. And superintendent action items A through F as amended. I'll move. Second. Any comments? Call the roll, please. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Mr. Bartz? Yes. So with that, we're going to move into executive session with a reminder that our next meeting is on the 22nd of August, which is a Tuesday due to some scheduling conflicts with myself being one of them. Well, but um, we're it's going a to. Good scheduling it is a good scheduling conflict. Thank That's you. That's all about me. That's all <laughs> that. So we're going to go into executive session as permitted by Section 121.22G1 of the Ohio Revised Code to consider the employment of public employees. May I have a motion to move into executive session? So moved. I'll second. Any comments? Call the roll, please. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. And Mr. Bartz? Yes, and as a reminder, we will only come back to the boardroom to adjourn. So for all of you who came tonight, thank you for coming. Be safe on your way home.